Hi friends, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today we have a really exciting video in store. We're going to be taking a garden tour of one of my girlfriend's gardens over in the United Kingdom. Now this year I discovered a wonderful gardening YouTube channel called Murphy's Garden. And the creator of this channel, her name's Jenny and her channel is named for her beautiful dog, Murphy. And her garden is such an inspiration. It's filled with multiple garden rooms, a parterre garden, a sunken garden, a woodland garden, a pleached walk, a long gravel walk. There's just garden after garden, room after room, filled with inspiration. And behind all of it is this wonderful creator, Jenny. So I hope you enjoy this entire garden tour because it's jam packed with inspiration and information. And Jenny said something at the very beginning that really touched my heart. And then if you watch all the way to the end of the video, which I I hope you will. Her closing shot just really actually made me cry when I watched it for the first time. So let's go ahead, take a look at Jenny's garden and please do go ahead after the video, go over to her YouTube channel, Murphy's Garden, subscribe, watch some of her fabulous videos. But for now, let's take a look at Jenny's absolutely stunning English garden. Hello, my name is Jenny and I have been asked by Danielle to be a guest on her channel and thank you very much Danielle, it's a real honour to be asked and we've got a very different garden from Danielle in so much that we are in a completely different location. We are here in the UK and we're in North Shropshire and North Shropshire is located on the west side of England and we actually border on to Wales. Um, the climate here, we are USDA Zone 8 um, which means we get quite moderate weather. It doesn't go very cold and it doesn't get very hot. So quite moderate, um, which means we can grow quite a range of plants. So here in England, on the west side of England, we have um, fairly high rainfall compared to other parts of the UK, certainly in the south and on the east side, which is just as well really, because this garden is, we grow on very, very sandy soil. So all the plants have to be able to survive on those conditions. And we do rely on a bit of a downpour every so often just to keep our garden refreshed. So all the plants um, are plants that do well in those conditions. So my interest um, in gardening was primarily all about growing flowers, particularly herbaceous perennials. That's what I really enjoyed doing. Um, this part of the garden is full, packed full of um, herbaceous perennials. We'll just have a little look around here what we've got. So all the flowers here, you get quite up close to these borders. So some of the plants are quite delicate and quite, um, I have, I guess quite not massive clumps of things but lots of things and what I like here is this area is really good for picking flowers um, so I call it the quadrant garden but it's also the picking garden I suppose and what I love about um, picking flowers and this is something that I've just started doing I've been watching lots of Danielle's videos along with other youtubers that um, have like flower farms and things and I'm really getting into picking flowers um, fresh flowers but more um, more often than not dried flowers and the reason for that is because i i'm working all week and i sometimes don't have the time to you know pick and condition flowers so that i quite like to um, just hang them upside down and dry them and then be able to deal with them later and lots of the flowers i grow naturally dry quite well so we've got things like um, the gypsophilia and um, and the achillea tarmica and lots of different types of achillea and even salvias and lavender and things like that which all grow incredibly well and one of the things I love about picking flowers as opposed to looking at flowers as a gardener, I find when you're a gardener, you're going around looking for weeds and looking for the sort of imperfections, looking at things that need deadheading, um, pulling out weeds, cutting things back, moving things. But when you're a florist, it makes you focus on the positives and you see everything looking, you know, you focus in on all the things that are looking in their prime and looking good. So that's a really positive aspect to gardening, which I enjoy with flower picking. So we'll just have a little look around other parts of the garden. So we moved to this property um, back in 2009 and it was really a blank canvas. It was just a, a bit of grass and some um, conifer hedge and not, not much else, an old privet hedge. So everything you see here is thing, are things that we have planted. And in the first few years, the garden it was all about the design of the garden and how we, we could best lay it out to make it look good. And we wanted that kind of cottage garden feel. Um, and we wanted to divide the garden up into different zones, each of which would have a different feel. And the architecture of our house, we've got a, um, a Georgian farmhouse, which has that kind of doll's house appearance, very 
um, you know, very symmetrical, very traditional. And we felt it was the right thing to design the garden around the house and reflect the symmetry. So the garden, instead of having curves and things, it is very much straight lines, um, which I think reflect the kind of like the Georgian windows and the Georgian aspect um, and design of the house. The borders themselves, we have, they're quite kind of chaotic, but we have, have very straight edges, which kind of counteract the, um, the riot of plants in the borders. So we keep the edges very straight and very precise. And I like the way that looks. And um, we grow a mixture of things. There are perennial, herbaceous perennials mixed with annuals. I grow a lot of annuals from seed, like the Nicotiana. Um, we've got grasses, so here we've got this lovely Miscanthus Yakushima dwarf, which is great for flower arranging. We get these lovely plumes, um, which we use for flower arranging, and even things like seed heads, like in the poppies, um, again, really good for drying. And we've planted things like sunflowers at the back. So um, I like how the, the feel of these borders, you know, they look quite good in the colours. I like the colour themes of pinks and purples and whites. I tend to not have any red in the garden. However, I have got some Crocosmia, which is red and has snuck in. I'm not so sure whether I like it. So we're going now into a different part of the garden and this is our sunken garden and it's just a slight change in level, just a couple of steps down. And I try, we've tried to make this a completely different feel. So it's more of a kind of, um, like a breath of fresh air, a, a, a pause between the riot of colour in this garden and this is all kind of very muted colour palettes of just greens and whites and we've got these, these are um, Prunus lusitanica trees which they do need their, um, they need a bit of a cut soon, that will be happening in the next couple of weeks but we try and keep them in this nice umbrella shape and then we've got, um, in this garden we've got a lot of um, pleach trees, we've got a, a, a long row of pleached hornbeam um, which um, which my husband deals with that he pleaches that and, and cuts it that's just been done and then on this side we've got um, some pleached lime trees so um, that gives us really formal structure and just makes the garden um, divides the garden up without hard barriers so we'll head now into the woodland garden and in the woodland garden um, we've planted um, just some silver birches. We've got um, some multi-stemmed ones, which we've kind of newly planted, and um, some single stem ones. And the nice thing about um, these trees is that they give this very light canopy, so it doesn't get too dark in here. Um, previously, we did have a lot of conifers in this area, and we find you just can't grow anything underneath. So by planting these trees, um, you can also plant beneath and so the woodland garden just is a bit of a nod to woodland in that we haven't got that many trees we've just got the um, silver birch but as we head into this area this area is more kind of shrubs and things and here we've got the hydrangea um, paniculata limelight and um, behind us here we've got this is the, the sort of maturity of the garden this is just a wild cherry tree um, with this bit of a split bark going on but we liked we decided to keep it because it just adds that height that we didn't have everything was very immature everything was just newly planted so by having something tall that's established it just gave us um, that height and we've used the, um, the, the the trunk just to grow some uh, clematis montana which looks really lovely i'll try and post a picture of that what it looked like a few weeks ago and we head round now here just got more, more planting. We've got um, the Verbena bonariensis and some um, some scabious, and then the Steeper gigantea, which is fabulous. Really, really love this plant. I've used it a few times throughout the garden, and it looks fabulous when it's sort of backlit or frontlit by the sun. And here we've got it growing next to the pond, so it kind of re is reflected in the water in the pond. And all the time we're just trying to improve things. So I've added this Catinus fairly recently. Um, and hopefully that will establish and get a, a bit bigger in the next few years. And we've tried to use grasses as well as shrubs and things just to add a bit of movement and a bit of extra interest in the garden. So this area, we've just got a little pond here. Um, it's always lovely to have water in the garden. It really does um, change the feel of a garden. We've just got a very small pond, but we have got intentions of adding more water. Um, and we've got some goldfish and things in there, which is nice. 
but this is a nice seating area in that it's quite cool. It's a cooler part of the garden. It gets quite windy here. We have got quite a windy garden, so we always have to bear that in mind. And I think we've planted lots of hedges, which have really helped sort of create a bit of a microclimate because um, prior to that, it was very difficult to grow anything as it was so windy. So this part of the garden we call the rose parterre and a parterre is just a formal looking area which is divided up using hedges and it comes from um, the French um, gardens, the parterres that they had which were sometimes were very intricate. This is quite a simple one but it uses yew hedging at the back and then box at the, in the foreground and then we've just infilled each of the um, four areas with roses so these are still establishing but these are David Austin Desdemona roses and then we've also got a little um, clematis which is Princess Kate clematis climbing up the obelisk in the middle. So now you join me in the long borders and these are big herbaceous borders which are backed with um, beech hedging and then um, box around the front and that does um, two things it gives that creation of um, you know zones the area and kind of holds all the planting in but also it um, protects all the plants from the wind and it does that really well and these borders and in fact the whole garden we're constantly working on all the time and looking at ways we can improve it and these borders look outstanding in the early spring or sort of may time they look really lovely but a little bit further into the season they start to kind of go a little bit flat in areas so there's some things that are doing well like the steeper and the obelisks look good but the planting just isn't quite there. So we're just getting ideas, looking at things, ways in which we can improve. And I think we need kind of bigger clumps of, of planting and um, perhaps more kind of prairie-like planting just to make these borders a little bit more impactful. And it's important that they look good from a distance because we can see them up from the windows in the house. So they've got to look um, big and bold. I love coming out early in the morning and just going around the garden and looking at what's looking good what's in flower and just going around picking a few of my favorites and um, preparing them for arranging so i'm just going to run through i've just picked all these flowers and it's still um, quite early in the morning so these will be conditioning throughout the day and then i'll use them to make um, a bouquet later on and i'm not doing it on any commercial level or on a large scale it's just purely for my own enjoyment and also um, I do have lots of friends and family who've got birthdays at this time of year and I love that because then I can do them a lovely fresh bouquet which I really enjoy and I love giving it to them because they um, really love them. Uh, this is some eucara so we've got um, all sorts of things. We've got gypsophilia, I've got achillea, I've got different achillea that I find really valuable. I love this um, achillea tarmica, the pearl and then just the standard ordinary achillea in all different colours. We've got it in yellow, we've got it in blush pink, white, and um, this dark pink. I've got, um, here I've got eupatorium. This is gora, or um, enuthra as it's now called. I've never used that in uh, floral arrangements before. I suspect it's probably not that great. I don't think it will last that long, but I'll, I'll give it a go and see. I've got loads of um, lavender, which is always very valuable in fresh and dried arrangements. This is um, Salvia Amistad, and this is the flowers from the Eucara, which I really like, and that does last very well. Um, we've got some, there's no more of that. The Echinacea is just starting to open, just picked the first one, but we will have lots of it later on. Veronicastrum, I like this for the um, pointy finger-like stems finger like um, flowers they're lovely and they look really good slightly higher up in the arrangement and then um so we've got um some this is um, rodolphia and we've also got thyme which is lovely and smells very nice too and um, some antirrhinums this is called apple blossom and then i like the drumstick alliums, I find these really valuable. I find all alliums very valuable, um, but at this time of year, which we're now in July, the drumstick alliums are just coming out. So the other ones, the um, Christophii have gone over as have the um, purple sensation, but we can still use them in flower heads. So here I've got a Christophii um, dried flower head, which was just in the border. And these are 
really valuable, especially later on in the season when things are starting to um, go over, you know, for dried arrangements. And these are just the, some other varieties, just the seed heads. So they, they also can be added to floral displays. Um, and I also like to use grasses. I did a video last week on different types of grasses that we have growing in the garden and ones that are particularly valuable for um, floral arrangements. And this is Stipa. So this is really good for like big, quite dramatic arrangements. So you can have this just a bit of, add a bit of light and airiness to the floral displays. So grasses are really good. This is a um, Penicetum, Carly Rose. So all of these things are very valuable. We've got some more um, salvia. This is salvia nemorosa, I think that one is. And this is another little allium called hair for obvious reasons. That's cute, isn't it? So I like to just go through the border, just picking um, floral displays based on what's looking good in the garden at that time. So it's always quite personal. Um, bouquet because they're always very different and you don't quite know what you're going to get. That's Cosmos um, Purity. And this is the, um, these are the flocks. Actually, I don't think I'm going to use these because the petals are falling off them already. This is another salvia. This is called um, Salvia um, Viritas, I think it's called. I've grown this from seed this year. It's done really well. And because I've grown it from seed, I've got masses of it. So I've put it in lots of bits of the borders. This is Thylictrum, another one that's great for adding that sort of airiness to a floral display. And then that's it really, just more of the same. Some Achillea, Persicaria, and um, more of the foliage. So we just cut the stems at an angle. And then I leave them in the water cold water in a dark darkened room to condition and then they'll be ready to arrange later on today and so i'm just doing a nice little hand tied bouquet it's all very natural and just um, flowers from the garden and then we'll just put, add some grasses just as a finishing touch and then the bouquet is hand tied and then just wrapped in some brown paper. And I just like the simplicity of brown paper. It just finishes it off. And that makes a nice gift for a friend or a family member. So this is the um, bouquet all finished. And then these are some of the dried flower arrangements that we've been working on as well. So I hope you enjoyed the tour of my garden and we've still got lots to do when we're still learning all the time but I'm really really enjoying all the skills that I've picked up on Danielle's channel and I'm trying to put it into practice and making some lovely bouquet so still learning but i um, really enjoying it so thanks very much Danielle and back to you in Pennsylvania. Well, thanks so much to Jenny for sharing her absolutely exquisite garden with us. Wasn't it so inspirational to see all of those garden rooms and to also see how they connect? I'm also just so inspired by the fact that all of that is on one acre. To me, if I had to guess how many acres she was working with, I would have guessed at least three, but it just goes to show that by sectioning things off into rooms, it really creates a much larger space at the end of the day. And I just love learning from Jenny. She has a wide variety of videos to watch. She takes you on different estate tours. She does propagation, pruning videos. But what I really, really love is she shares her personal garden with us and how she's taken inspiration from large estate gardens and kind of transferred that into a more attainable space that we all might find ourselves in. And I just love watching every single one of her videos. So like I said, I hope you will subscribe to her. It's a lot of work to put one of these videos together and to work with another creator and get it onto YouTube. So I hope you'll give this video a like, subscribe to her channel, share this video with a friend so we can get her more and more viewers. And you know, I just love that she said in the beginning 
of the video about how when you're someone who cuts the flowers, you're focusing on the beauty of the garden and you're not as overwhelmed by all the things that maybe are going wrong within the garden. It's interesting, this year especially, there's a lot going wrong in my garden, but I'm so thankful that I'm able to focus on the beauty. And Jenny kind of reminded me to do that because I've been talking a lot to my husband and friends about being frustrated about the grass situation that's going on over here. I have blight in my main flower walk and that really kind of, at least I thought it diminished the fact of how good the borders look this year. The borders looked really good, but the grass looked so bad. I felt like it was taking away from the borders themselves. But I'm going to take Jenny's advice and I'm just going to focus on the beauty, the positive and the flowers. And eventually I'll be able to take care of this grass situation. But friends, for now, I wanna wish you a wonderful day. I have some more tours with fellow gardeners from overseas lined up. So I'm really excited to share those with you. But for now, I wanna wish you a wonderful day. And of course, happy gardening. Bye.